thank you for that introduction. That was very kind of you. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and talk to you all tonight. I'm going to be sharing with you uh, an overview of this book that I co-edited uh, with Carol Blesser. It, we published it in 2001, so it's 10 years old, but I, I will tell you that uh, we still feel very strongly, proudly, that this book uh, it made an impact, but there's still work to be done on this subject. I'm going to uh, talk about the different marriages in the book, including the one that I wrote on, the Pickett's, uh, and share with you some of the highlights, low lights of these marriages, and what we felt in the end we found as conclusions in examining relationships, not just a single individual's life, which of course is usually the way biographers uh, approach their subject. Uh, first of all, of course, it's important to remember that marriage in the 19th century, particularly in the mid-19th century, had a different meaning than it does today. Uh, marriage was becoming more romantic, people were beginning to believe that you did seek out your soulmate, but it, it was evolving. There were still marriages that were made primarily for financial reasons, uh, practical uh, sort of versus the romantic. So what we found in these 12 couples were, were a mix. Uh, some couples that clearly were as much sort of a political, practical decision and, and some that were purely romantic. Also another point, which you might know, but it's worth reminding that divorce was unheard of in the 19th century. Uh, and so there really wasn't an option. The person you married, you were pretty much stuck with uh, your whole life. So, um, you know, and frankly, women, women did have less choice. Uh, but, you know, it didn't mean though, what we find with these marriages too interestingly, though, some of the unhappy marriages in some cases, the couples separated. They lived different lives. And they, they, as much as they could, sort of survived as they might have had they lived in the modern world in sort of a divorced state. But it wouldn't have been acceptable. Uh, the option wasn't there for them to formally divorce. The other concept to keep in mind in thinking about marriage during the time of the Civil War is the notion of the separate sphere. Uh, this was something uh, that th this is an ideal that came about in, with the influx of the Industrial Revolution that middle class women, particularly middle class white women, were seen to exist in a separate sphere, domestic sphere, apart from their husbands at home, nurturing the children, nurturing the household. They were literally creating a haven in a heartless world. Uh, and that the men were coming out into the uh, world as, as it was um, as providers. And so that when they came home, the wife was there waiting for them. But now, the reality of it was, it was, almost, it was almost impossible to maintain a separate sphere. But that notion was there, there was, there was a very self-conscious effort to maintain separation between the genders that women oversaw. Another point about this, was that women were seen, particularly again, white middle class or upper class women, as paragons of moral virtue, right? That they were supposed to be better somehow than their men. So we have these expectations in place. And this is North and South, something else to keep in mind, interestingly, that as much as we have a North and a South divided by war, these gender expectations hold up uh, across uh, the nation. So as I said to you, we were trying in this book to what we perceived to fill a gap in the, in the literature, be mindful of these uh, concepts, and look at these men in a different light. Now we ended up with 12, uh, and we called them military commanders. We chose President Davis, Carol Blesser wrote on him, uh, and, and any of you that know anything about, uh, if you know anything about the Civil War, you know that, of course, he was president of the Confederacy, but he really wanted to be a general, so we figured that was good enough. Oh, military command. We didn't do Abraham Lincoln. There's been a lot written about Mary Lincoln and their marriage. 
Uh, some have criticized us for that, not including the Lincolns. I have thought actually in the years since the book came out, we could easily do a second volume and perhaps we will um, because there's lots of couples uh, waiting. But so we have, we also have an admiral. Uh, so we have one naval couple. So first the Davises. Uh, Jefferson and Rena Davis, they married in 1845, and it was a very complex relationship. Now, Jefferson Davis had been married before. We do find this in a, a few of these other um, marriages, these other relationships, where the women, uh, the wives, were second or even third wives. There was an 18-year difference between them. Uh, Jefferson had been married. Uh, to the daughter of Zachary Taylor, and many believe, many of his biographers claim that that was his first love, his first wife, and he never really got over it, and he never was truly as much in love with Marina. Uh, well, Marina was extremely outspoken, opinionated, and even political. She had a mind of her own, and that wasn't going to quite work with Jefferson Davis. Uh, it became clear in their relationship early on that he expected her to play the role of a traditional what uh, to allow them to have this, as we have here in these words from Carol Blesser, the ideal of a patriarchy, whereby he would be the head of the household. And it was a struggle. They have a long marriage, but there were, there were times when it was, it was, it was really tried, their, their relationship really tested. They had six children, not all of them lived to adulthood. In fact, Marina will outlive all of her, her children. Um, and there will be moments of real alienation um, between the two of them. The wartime brought them together. And what's so interesting, I think, in looking at this couple, Marina has been often criticized. She's even called the shrew of the Confederacy. Because if you read much about the inner workings of the White House, you keep coming across her. Jefferson Davis was ill much of the time. And she apparently was running things, she and Judah Benjamin. She was signing, she was forging her husband's signature. Um, now, a lot of biographers blame her for this. They, they don't find this to be a positive. But I think if you, you know, take your glance and, and look in a very different way, uh, perhaps you would see this as a, as a strength. She was helping to keep the Confederacy together. He really had to rely on her. After the war ended, uh, his health, both their health, not, not very good, but he ended up living on a plantation of another woman. And this was not exactly a good thing for their marriage. Uh, <laughs> but after his death, she was strident in her defense of her husband, and we will find that theme over and over. Well, this marriage, uh, the Lees. Robert E. Lee, what can I say? Uh, one of the saints, or the saint, of the Confederacy. And I don't know if you know very much about Mary Lee, but I've always felt that it would be difficult to be married to a god. Um, Robert E. Lee was... <laughs> Robert E. Lee was um, driven to, to be perfect. Uh, we know he graduated from West Point without one demerit. So imagine being his wife. Uh, Mary Lee uh, was, again, you know, like Marina, she hasn't really been well treated by a biographer. Now, Emory Thomas, in his piece for our book, he grapples with this. He talks about her, Mary Lee, that she, she had her, her foibles but that this was a successful marriage, that they complemented one another. And again, if you read enough about these two people and understand that Robert E. Lee, he was this very talented commander, very charismatic, extremely popular, and comfortable around young women, enjoyed flirting with young women, but his wife was his best friend. And his wife, witty, outspoken like Marina, it truly was this interesting dynamic. And as I have here, she proved to be his anchor throughout their lives to get throughout their life together. She also gave him something that he very much needed when they met. Uh, she gave him respectability that he had lost. His father had abandoned the family and brought shame. Uh, she, through her family, the Custis, Custises, uh, gave him Arlington House. Uh, she uh, gave him wealth and prestige, and this was something he had craved as a child. So really interesting, when you, really, when you start to dig down here, what was going on with the, with the Lee family. 
Stonewall Jackson is another person in the Civil War narrative who has as much myth surrounding him as anything else. Stonewall Jackson was also married twice, Thomas Jonathan Jackson. His first wife died giving birth to a daughter. And like uh, Jefferson Davis, some have argued that similarly his first wife was the love of his life. Now he married his second wife, Mary Anna, uh, a few years before the Civil War. They won't be married long. Their marriage lasts just a few years before, of course, as we know, he's, he's killed during the Battle of Chancellorsville. But in this essay by Sarah Gardner, Sarah Gardner argues that Mary Anna desperately sought to marry a hero, and that's exactly what she got. And like we see with Marina Davis and some of these others, Mary Anna was intent on promoting her husband and ensuring that he would be never forgotten uh, and, and again remembered as a, as a hero. Their dynamics are also quite fascinating. Uh, she was looking to ensure that people knew about him when he was alive, that, his ex that she could exploit anything occurring on the battlefield, and he didn't want this going on. He was very humble and modest uh, and less concerned with this kind of uh, attention. And who knows what would have happened if he had lived through the war and the post-war and the lost cause and all that. It would be interesting to think about. But in the end, she will become fiercely defensive and protective of his memory and something we call a professional widow. <laughs> this, became her, this became her job. Uh, and she makes a living off of it, being his wife, being his widow. And that is her identity. Well, the Pickett's, the uh, George and LaSalle Pickett's, this is the, the article that I wrote. Um, what can I say? Well, George Pickett was on his third wife. I think he wins the prize for most wives. George was a romantic. If you know uh, the George Pickett you meet in the film Gettysburg or Reading Pillar Angels, that's the LaSalle for Belle Pickett. Um, she also, like Mary Anna Jackson, became a professional widow. She earned quite a living, or tried to at least, in promoting her husband. Now, the problem with the Picketts is LaSalle Corbell Pickett wrote a lot of fiction and claimed it to be fact. So you have to try to sort all this, all this out, and it gets, it gets very, very difficult. Um, they will marry during the war. She claims that they met before the, before the war, years before, that they had met on a beach. She was a child, sick, and had come across a young man staring into space uh, and wondered if he was sick too. He was an army officer home from on leave and they had a conversation. She claims at that very moment, sometime in the 1850s, they became engaged. She was six, six years old. <laughs> Complete fabrication. First of all, she always lied about her age. Always, always, always. Um, so that part's a lie. But secondly, I never have been able to find any evidence that they ever meet, met on this beach. And um, He also, during this time, he had gone AWOL because his first wife died, but then he goes out west and marries another woman. So if he's engaged to her, well, that would make things very interesting. And also probably illegal or something. If he's engaged to a six-year-old, I don't want to think about it. But anyway, <laughs> the story, what I have been able to show and, and prove is that they do start an actual relationship during the war, because other people talk about it. You can find corroborating evidence. It's so much so that other people are complaining about it, because he's leaving his command in the middle of the night when he's supposed to be uh, in charge of a division, which is a lot of men, to see LaSalle Corbell. As I said, they, they marry in 1863, after the Battle of Gettysburg, where he watches his division destroyed in front of him during the famed Pickett's Charge. Uh, his career is actually going on a, a downward spiral. Uh, they marry, have two children, uh, and it's, it's getting to be more and more uh, troubling for George Pickett. The war, uh, the loss of his division, his health, uh, there are accusations of cowardice against him. 
But LaSalle becomes his anchor, much like Verena Davis did for Jefferson Davis during the war. Their relationship is strengthened by war. After the war, they will live in exile in Montreal for a while because there are accusations, of, uh, there's charges, possibility of war crime charges uh, against Pickett. And in the end, he will die at the age of 50. LaSalle will live for another five decades as this, as I said, professional widow, giving lectures, writing books, poetry, you name it, promoting her soldier, romantic, peace-loving, really the opposite of what everything I've been able to find about him that was accurate and factual. <laughs> well, Richard Yule isn't as famous as some of the others that I've mentioned just prior. Um, you would have to know a little bit more about the Confederacy Army in Northern Virginia to come across his name, but he's, he's intriguing. He was one of the commanders under Lee, and some have wondered, well, what went wrong with Ewell? He seemed promising. Uh, and many point to his wife, uh, Lazinka Ewell. Elizabeth Brown, uh, she was known as Lazinka. Uh, she had married, for her, this was her second marriage. Her first marriage had been uh, a disaster. It was an abusive marriage, and her husband uh, d died in suicide. She ended up inheriting quite a bit of money and contested the will of her husband. Eventually, she ended up, she ended up getting it back, uh, inheriting uh, this large plantation. So she was an independent, wealthy woman and widow when she married her cousin, her first cousin. She's used to living on her own and speaking her own mind. And uh, Richard Ewell, Dick Ewell, this caused a lot of friction. And they had a difficult, a difficult relationship. He did not uh, take well to her coming to camp. She was known as General Brown. Uh, <laughs> some accused her of basically you know, running, uh, running his staff. She was very concerned with her son, who was a member of the uh, of Yule staff, and there have been some that said that you know his whole, all of his problems as a commander were due due to his due to his wife. We, we won't ever know for sure. But these two were individuals that seemed sort of star-crossed. Uh, after the war, they ended up sort of reconciling, but they died within a few days of each other of typhoid fever. Well, the last of the Confederate couples in the book <coughs> are the Gorgases. Like the Yules, not quite as famous, but also very, very interesting. Uh, Josiah Gorgas was the chief of ordnance for the Confederacy. Talented, capable, competent. Josiah actually came from a Philadelphia family, and he married an Alabamian belle and went south when the uh, Confederacy was created. He refused to join his northern family and uh, instead chose, chose his, married, uh, his married family, you know, in, in picking a shot. Uh, a very traditional marriage on the, on the surface. He was the provider, she raised the family, the children at home, she was, they very much had that separate sphere. But after the war, his health was broken, they were struggling financially, and there was a need for money, and she stepped up to, to work and, and found work as a librarian. And she had to step out of that separate sphere. It was not comfortable for her after so many years of doing what had been expected of her and what had been taught to her. But Reconstruction, just as challenging in some, in some ways, more so <clears throat> than the Civil War, particularly in the post-war South. This, uh, these were trying times for the Gordises. Throughout, they certainly remain very, very devoted to each other. And as uh, Sarah Wiggins says, it was a, a, a certainly a happy marriage, a successful marriage, but uh, a difficult, difficult times these two were, were facing. Well, on the Union side, we start out with the Grants. Of course, from here in Ohio, probably the happiest marriage in the book, uh, Julia and Ulysses Grant. Uh, but more of the ironies and the contradictions, it is true Ulysses Grant's father, Ulysses S. Grant's father, was an abolitionist, and Julia K. 
came from a family of slaveholders. In fact, she herself owned slaves, even during the Civil War. So here she was married to the man credited with giving the Union, and she owned slaves. Uh, <coughs> that did not seem to get in the way of their marriage. I, I don't know, it must have, I would think it would be just some interesting dinner conversations, but maybe not. <laughs> Uh, John Simon, who wrote this piece for us, the longtime editor of the Grant Papers, uh, describes these two as, you know, again, complimenting one another. Julia, much more comfortable socially, although both of them very home-oriented, family-oriented, loving to their, two, to their four children. Uh, whoops, I'm sorry. Grant, and many of you know this already, as successful as he was in war, he had been a failure, pretty much in anything else in his life, but he was successful as a father and a husband. It's also been speculated that when he was with his wife, he was more stable, he didn't drink as much, just happier. And this is not surprising, this kind of thing that we take for granted today for, with their families, when they're separated from them, then they struggle. Uh, you know, as a professional military officer before the war, before he left the, the army, it, it was a strain on their family life. And that was one of the reasons he ended up leaving the army in the years before the Civil War. Uh, and we do find in this marriage, you wouldn't want to call it necessarily a romantic marriage, but truly a compa companionate marriage. One where these two people uh, resemble or display a friendship. Well, the Shermans, also from Ohio. And I have to tell you, I think the strangest marriage, not just in this book, but that I've ever, ever read about. <laughs> because here is the thing. <clears throat> William Sherman married his foster sister. His father-in-law was his foster father. That's just strange. He had married the woman that had, he had known as his foster sister since the time he was nine. So they had a 60 plus year relationship. Um, so, it's, so it's sort of no wonder that they had some problems. I'm just saying. Uh, John Marcellick wrote this piece for us. He's a biographer of Sherman. Uh, the, the, these two, they were not. They were not, they seemingly not compatible. One of the major problems in their marriage, too, was religion. The uh, Yule family, which uh, Ellen came from, was devoutly Catholic. And when William came to live with them, he lost his father at the age of nine. And his mother, because she was desperate for money, essentially all the children in the Sherman family were just divvied up, most of them, that is. A few, I guess, lived with her. But William was sent to live with the Yules. In fact, his name was Tecumseh. That was his original given name. But when he went to live with the Yules, they would not accept that his name was an Indian name. So they gave him the name William, a Christian name. And he hated that. And that just spoke for, that was symbolic of his view uh, of the Yules and, and sort of feeling pushed in and pressed upon by this family. Uh, he wanted to impress his father-in-law, the Yule family, very powerful important family uh, from here in Ohio, but he also resented them and never felt like he did quite live up to their expectations. Uh, and Ellen, extremely devoted to her father, but also pulled by her husband. So the dynamics within this family are complicated. <clears throat> well, we have a handful of these uh, marriages that occurred during the war. And here's another one. We had the Pickets. We had, uh, I guess this is the other one, the Custers. Uh, I always, I've had people ask me before about comparing the Pickets and the Custers because LaSalle, Corbell Pickett, and Libby Custer both very devoted to their husbands and actively promoted them after the war. But I've always said that Libby had a lot more to work with. Um, <laughs> Well, Libby Custer came from a prominent Michigan family and uh, met George Armstrong Custer, known as Audie, uh, when they were uh, 
when the war had begun, and they began this very, this really whirlwind courtship. They married in 1864. They never would have any children. Some have speculated it was because of uh, sexually transmitted diseases that, or disease that uh, George had picked up during his many uh, aliases through his years. We'll never know for sure, but it was a, uh, it was a issue between them that she would never have children. Again, these were expectations for a woman of her status and uh, of the age that she would become a mother. But instead, she would devote her energies to her husband, to her boy general. Again, like some of these other wives, she became a professional widow when he died, as you all know, in, uh, at Little Bighorn. During the war, much of their uh, focus was on first a very passionate courtship, and then her promoting him as much as she could. She lived in Washington, D.C. She would meet with, she would meet with uh, congressmen and ensure as much as she could that people were not forgetting about her husband, that he was front line and center on people's minds. Anything he was doing was thought of positively. Well, this couple, it might surprise you, Many know today about Joshua Chamberlain, the hero of Gettysburg, after reading Killer Angels. Fewer know anything about his wife, Fanny Chamberlain. Uh, it, it, I, I think it would stun you to know that she could care less that he was a hero. Care less. In fact, she resented it. Uh, she did not want him to join the army. And by the time he had his fourth or fifth wound, she was done. <laughs> Come home. You've had enough already. Uh, yeah, seriously. He kept <laughs> going back for more. Um, and Joshua Chamberlain wins a Congressional Medal of Honor. He becomes this, yeah, he's a true hero. But his wife cannot and refuses to share in it. Uh, the war strained their wartime, strained their marriage. Uh, before the war, they, they had problems. Things had not been easy. They lost a child. Uh, there had been difficulties uh, even during their courtship, but they had had a pretty passionate uh, relationship. There's clear love between these two people, very intelligent people. Fanny Chamberlain, uh, outspoken, bright. She had been a school teacher in Georgia. We know Joshua or Lawrence, as he was called by her, a uh, professor at Bowdoin. But when the war came, this was the divider. She could not support his military service. She did not understand it, and she could not share in it. And this beca became his new identity. And after the war, he continued to revel in his wartime exploits. There were accusations of domestic abuse. There was a chance of them becoming divorced. I told you how very rare this was. Unheard of. They do stay together. And late in life, they seem to reconcile but they really have a very rocky, rocky time of it. Well, another absolutely, uh, I keep repeating the word, but fascinating um, couple, the Fremonts. John Fremont, known as the Pathfinder, had been a military adventurer before the Civil War, had been the first Republican candidate for president in 1856. Uh, his background, uh, as much as it was impressive, he also had some dark uh, spots. He was illegitimate. He had been, he'd grown up in a boarding house uh, in Savannah. He married well. Jesse Benton came from one of the most powerful families, political families in Missouri. And uh, this was a definite step up for him. She was also incredibly bright uh, and vivacious, outgoing. Um, but John continued to have some demons. There were times where they were separated uh, emotionally as much as physically. And the war was quite a challenge for their marriage. At the beginning of the war, it brought them back together. He had come in from the West, and uh, they united. He had command in uh, Missouri, and many of you know of his famous decree freeing slaves in Missouri, which was extremely controversial. Uh, there's a, a very well-known story where uh, Lincoln got wind of this decree, and he 
uh, was not happy about it. This was early in the war, August of 1861, uh, long before Lincoln was prepared to issue his own Emancipation Proclamation. And he was furious at Fremont. Jesse, feeling that she came from this powerful family and feeling comfortable speaking to the President of the United States, demanded an interview with the President and waltzed into his office and made her case. Apparently, Lincoln was so taken aback by this, he didn't even offer her a seat. Uh, it was quite a scene. Uh, in the end, Lincoln was unmoved, and Fremont's career is pretty much over, his military career. He will be out of the Army by you know, a few, more, few months later. We know, of course, he'll, he'll try to run for president again, um, and that'll, that'll fizzle. But uh, their relationship will start to tip where she is, is seen as playing the strong role in the background too much, a lot like Lazinka Yule. And he will be criticized for it. He will be seen as the weak male because his wife is doing too much. Uh, and, and this will be unacceptable in 19th century uh, Victorian society. And finally, we have another Lee family. Uh, Admiral Lee, Samuel Philip Lee, and Elizabeth Blair. Uh, Samuel Philip Lee, Phillips Lee, was the third cousin to Robert E. Lee. But he did not join the Confederacy. He joined the Union. He was a Navy man and stayed with the United States Navy. He, during the war, uh, I mean, so, I'm sorry, before the war, they, because he had been in the Navy, there had been weeks and weeks and months and months where they had been separate. And she had raised their family and run the household without him. So the war did not change that. Uh, but they also had those tensions within whereby she came from a strong political family. She came from a prominent political family, the Blairs. And he felt that and seemed to struggle with it. Uh, and they had times where he was extremely distant and refused to write her. And after the war, they even lived in two separate homes, like the Davises. But they reunited late in life. So as I said to you, you know, we see these times where maybe in the modern world, a couple like this would divorce. Maybe even remarry somebody else. That was not an option. <laughs> so they stayed together. So we left ourselves with these questions of, which we started with. We left with these questions that we started with. How did the war affect marriage? And how did marriage affect the war? Uh, well, in looking at this, these well, couples, and admittedly, they're all members of the elite. They all uh, had options that many everyday Americans, most everyday Americans did not have. Uh, we have to be careful about some of these conclusions, right? We talk about marriage and, and wartime. But in, in the first question, how did war affect marriage? In some cases, it was, it was it, you could see it was measurable. In the cases of the Davises, the Jacksons, the Custers, the Yules, the Chamberlains, the Fremonts, and the Picketts, uh, the war definitely affected their relationships, and in many cases negatively. Uh, of course, the Jackson, Stonewall Jackson, dies. Uh, the, the Chamberlains, they never really recover, even though Chamberlain becomes a hero. Uh, with the Davises, the war brings them together. And then the post-war, they're separate again. And yet, once Jefferson himself dies, Marina seems to reconcile herself in the memory of her husband. The Pickett's definitely brought together by war. I don't think there's any question that these two people love one another. Uh, it's curious, they might not have met if there hadn't been a civil war. And perhaps, too, with the Custers. The war seemed to be part of defining their marriage. There are other couples in this group, but the war didn't seem to matter at all. It seemed to just be happening outside. The Lees, uh, their patterns, their dynamics, well entrenched long before the Civil War. We know that Robert E. Lee, at times, came within a few miles of his wife's home, but did not go to visit her. 
He was used to being far from his wife. Now, that did not mean that he didn't write her and keep her informed, but they had been married a long time before the Civil War. They were married after, of course, only cut short by his death. And the Civil War did not seem to have either a negative or positive effect. And same true for the Gorgases. The post-war took more of a toll on the Gorgases. Now, how did marriage affect war? How did the relationship between this, these famous couples, these powerful individuals, affect the American Civil War? That gets very interesting. I think that in the case of the Pickett's, that marriage was crucial to our memory today of George Pickett. I don't think he would be remembered the way he is, as this romantic, cavalier individual without his wife's doing. Same with Custer, the boy general. That became Libby Custer's life's work. Perhaps with Jesse Fremont, if she had not been there to bolster her husband and promote her husband, we don't know what would have happened to his career, negatively or positively. We also have a situation with Sherman, which I, you might know about, uh, too, a very famous story where he was accused of insanity when he's uh, stationed in Louisville. His wife, rarely did she step out of this kind of private role that she played. She went to Washington and, and, and sought out Lincoln to make a case for her husband. Uh, so we see these situations, you know, if Sherman had not been sort of rescued from these attacks of being accused of uh, insanity, would we have had the famed march to the sea? We don't, we don't know. It is clear that the Civil War did not necessarily destroy marriage. It did strain, it did try the dynamics of marriage, but these larger social constraints kept unions together. We do need, of course, much more attention on the marriages of everyday Americans. We just don't know that much about common soldiers and what was going on between their wives and them. What's so ironic is the thousands and thousands of letters that historian, historians have routinely consulted almost always have been written to their wives. So we have the evidence. We just have to think about it differently and begin to consider the question of relationships. This division that often occurs of separating out the home front from the battle front, it still exists. It's imaginary. It did not exist during the time of the war. It didn't exist in the minds of these people. They easily and naturally shifted from personal to public. We see this over and over again. Again, whether it's a common soldier's letter or a famous general like Robert Lee, he'll be talking about Gettysburg. He'll be mentioning a campaign. And then he'll, in the next sentence, talk about the children, want to know how one of his daughters is doing. So that line is a line that historians have created. I think it's really important that we ensure that that boundary is erased. Thank you very much. about whether any of the marriages I talked about were divorced, no. The closest they came to a divorce were the Chamberlains, and they never did divorce. They ended up uh, reconciling, as I said, and staying married, married until, um, I can't remember who ended up dying first, but yeah, they do end up staying married. Yes, sir? I know there's a couple of other famous last names that are the Adams, uh, and the um, Benton. Well, the Fanny Adams, no, she, she was not uh, related. Georgia. 
Right. Well, she no. She she. The question was whether or not the the, Adam, the mention of Adams and Benton was the famous families. Uh, ben Adams was not uh, related, from what I know, to the uh, Adams family uh, in New England. She had spent some time in Georgia teaching, but she she was from New England. But I don't believe there's a direct connection. But the, yes, the Benton family was the same. Uh, yes, powerful Benton family. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, um, about the common soldiers. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, several times during the, the, the we've heard about um, examples of gentlemen who were well established <coughs> citizens in their communities with several children, maybe many children, and a farm or a business who volunteered and went and, and just apparently walked away from the we might observe. Uh, do you have any sense of why so many of these guys were willing to do that? What philosophical or political reason? Well, you, and your question is... What why would they volunteer? Oh, volunteer. These were right. Crafty. Right. Leave. Volunteer and leave their families and their wives. The question is why they would. Yeah, just right. <coughs> right. Well, that, that actually is a really good question about why soldiers would vol volunteer and, and in many cases, as you said, leave wives and families uh, to fend for themselves. Uh, and when you look at these common soldiers, they, they're left without their main provider. Uh, living on a soldier's salary often wasn't enough. And then if they end up in prison, uh, there might not be a salary anymore. Of course, then they end up dead. Uh, states would struggle to see if they could help provide for some of these families. Some of them began to create provisions for widows, it really depended. It was kind of a stop and start effort. I think, I think what, you're, what you're asking gets into these questions about you know, motivation for why men fought. And a lot of them, you know, in the South, it did become this issue of tying the home front. Again, the home front and the battle front, that these men felt that it, it was all one. Uh, that they were, in fact, defending as much their homes, their families, as their country. And that if they didn't leave and fight for the Confederacy, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be a reason to stay, to stay home with their, with their wives and their families. And of course, the issue of slavery is certainly central to that, that this was all one. They had to defend, as they would call, their, their way of life. Now, in the North, it's a little more complicated, right? You've got, you've got this question of the Union. But it, it's an ideological question, and it's still, I think, it's still there, that these Northern men believed uh, it was the right thing to do that as men they still had to go and fight to protect this abstraction called the Union. But as the war wore on, we know, and Drew Faust, the historian Drew Faust first began to speculate about this in the South, that it began to be harder and harder for these men and women to reconcile the challenges of being away from their families and supposedly fighting for their country, their the Union, the South, they're getting letters from home telling them there's not enough food, their children are sick, uh, come home. Because that's what started to happen. And yet they have to stay in the military. Uh, it became, it got to be, and we have this version, it got to be incredibly difficult. Um, so the other point I would say to you is that there were men that joined because they thought it would help their families, because they, they did it to gain the bounty, to gain the pay. It was a steadier pay, perhaps, than they were getting uh, working in a factory, even working hard on a farm. Some of them believed that this was an opportunity. They believed whatever message they were getting from, from the uh, recruiting poster. So there's a lot going on there to make them do what they did, but it was very hard. And they left a lot of these women and wives, uh, you know, children in, tough, in a, a very tough state. Uh, pardon the interruption. Um, we can't hear the questions. I can bellow, but you can't. I don't know what's the matter with me. I'm about to give up. Oh, no. Here we go. Uh, it's, it's difficult for some of us to hear the, the questions. Dr. Gordon can, because she's obviously better than me. But if, if you would be tolerant enough with me, and I'd only take a second, I promise. And if you'd use the microphone, I think it would be better for the, for the entire group. If you please. Thank you. Uh, how many of these uh, marriages are restrained during the war by loss of children? Yes, yeah, so that, 
Right, the loss of children, that was a constant. That was another constant that all these families faced. Uh, one of the most famous stories, the, the Davis case. Jefferson Davis uh, was living in, in the so-called White House of the Confederacy. Their son Joe, five years old, uh, fell out a, a window uh, and died. Um, you know, just dropped off uh, the side of the, just had an accident, just an accident. Um, and that was a devastating loss to, to both of them, to Marina and to Jefferson in the middle of the war. And of course, all this death and suffering that they're witnessing and enduring as, an, as a nation to lose, to lose this little boy. Um, the Shermans, they lose one of their children in the middle of the war. I, I believe that Sherman had brought one of his sons with him to the front. Uh, I know the Fremonts did something similar uh, where, you know, sometimes these boys would go, they want to be with their fathers. And now, they, this opportunity was more common, of course, amongst the officers, whether it was wives or children showing up at in camp. You couldn't have that, I don't, I hesitate to call it luxury, not really a luxury, but to have that kind of opportunity. But it was dangerous. And in the case of the Shermans, this little boy who came with, uh, with them and ended up getting very sick and caught one of the terrible diseases and, and died. And Sherman never really seemed to forgive himself for that. So those are two that I can think of offhand uh, that just had a, a really powerful impact. Not to say that it wouldn't have an impact in general when, when children were, were lost, but the, those had the more. The Yules? I'm not sure. I don't think they, they had any children at all because they married sort of later, and she already had a grown son. So they, they, they were the other childless couple in the, um, in the book. <coughs> Quickly, with so many of the generals, two, three wives, was it most frequently that the first and second wives died in childbirth? Yes, yes. That, that's another theme that, um, yes, many of you are picking up on. Uh, the average for women, um, most women are having about you know seven children. Now, how many of those children are living to adulthood? Um, I don't want to. I don't want to venture to say without knowing for sure the number. But I know with the grants, and they have four children that all live to adulthood, and that was rare. Uh, the 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 Chamberlains have, I want to say, four, they have four and two live to adulthood. And th that, that's giving you a sense, you know, that kind of loss and tragedy, it's not as though people at that time didn't mourn the loss of their children any less than we do today, that they did. You know, you can read the letters. You can, you can really feel this emotion coming through. Um, so yes, these wives, these women, uh, childbirth, very dangerous. And of course, you know, questions of childbirth, uh, it's, it's really not a question. I mean, women are having children pretty much as long as they can have children uh, into their 40s. Brenda Davis, by the way, was pregnant a third of the time she was in the White House. Um, she's still having, I want to say her last child, she was in her early 40s. So most women are having babies until they're, you know, can't, again, until they can't. Um, but yes, it, it's dangerous, and if the woman survives it, oftentimes the, the children do not. So in the case, just quickly to uh, side script or postscript, in the case of Pickett, his first two wives both died giving birth. Well, his first wife, I should say, died giving birth. The second wife was a little more mysterious, but she died soon after giving birth. I wanted to ask about a lot of the, the common soldiers that lost their lives. Were there any war widow benefits for these women at that time? Like I said, now some, I just know that some, I can only speak for my newest project, my present project is on a Connecticut regiment and it deals with common soldiers. And there were some efforts in the state of Connecticut to begin to <coughs> help widows and orphans. Um, but I don't believe it was any kind of systematic uh, was there any kind of systematic effort? Um, now, after the war, there began to be you know the pensions that were created. That's when it already really kicked in. But during the war, 
it, it was much more haphazard that there were these kind of uh, opportunities, these kind of uh, outlets for families, for widows. Right, the, I mean, you just take, like you said, I mean, the point that life, the life expectancy uh, in general, and then you have the danger of childbirth, and then you add the, the war and the impact of the war. You're absolutely right. And if any of you have read Jufau's newest book, um, that focuses on the death toll, uh, our best guess, of course, is 620,000. Um, just her book looks at what that did to that generation of Americans, North and South. She's not making a distinction. I mean, she, she does in the book, but her, her larger point is what that did to this country coming out of that traumatic event, right? That you just don't easily recover. That that has to have long-standing repercussions to endure that kind of loss. fascinating to read the letters of John and Abigail Adams. Do you have a parallel couple for the Civil War or this reading of the human condition? Mm -hmm. Well, the, I think uh, from, from our collection here, um, the Lees wrote a good deal between each other because they were separate so much. Uh, there's that, the interesting thing, you know, when they're, the Davises, they got to be together during the war because they're living together in, in the White House. Uh, we don't, for the pickets, LaSalle wrote every, made everything up and actually fabricated letters, so you have to put that over here. But, um, but I would think of the Lees, um, the, Sh the Shermans wrote each other quite a bit. Uh, the, 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 like I was saying earlier about Robert E. Lee and the way he would shift back and forth between public and private, one of the interesting things that Emory Thomas found too in their letters is that Lee would be more detailed in describing campaign strategy to his wife at times than he was to the War Department. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know if I can think of anything quite of the level, I would say the Adams are unique. But I think you can find some absorbing exchanges, uh, absolutely. And, and I think that's what it will also convince you, I, I, I believe, if you, if you look and open your mind, that in the case of the Lees, that Mary Lee was not the sort of complaining and difficult woman that she's been portrayed by many of the Lee biographers, that again, she was Lee's best friend. If you, if you If you were to drive through Somerset, Ohio, you see a statue of Sheridan. Yeah. You did. Was he not married? Or oh, what? yeah. Sheridan's one of those ones that people have said to me we should include if we did a second volume. I don't know anything about his marriage, but he's so interesting that I can only guess that his marriage would be. <laughs> <laughs> right? I don't know if anybody here knows anything about him. Uh, yeah. I, I just. 